a journey to safe, mission-critical, continuous delivery at Descartes Labs. So what's this talk going to be about? Oh, and by the way, the talk slides are available in the Spinnaker Summit 2019 Slack channel if you want to follow along. What's this talk about? Um, this talks about the value of high velocity deployments and a short lead time to deploy. It's about how to approach Spinnaker with a small engineering team um, and AKA the value of self-service pipeline templating. It's about a pattern for deployments to Kubernetes using the V2 provider and it's about how application developers can become great Spinnaker operators. Um, and finally, it's about how Kubernetes and Istio and Spinnaker together make for powerful canary deployments. What's Descartes Labs? Well, Descartes Labs is a company that's building a data refinery to collect and process and analyze sensor data to quantify changes in the Earth. And as you might expect with anything Earth scale, that's a lot of data and a lot of compute. Our platform drives global scale machine learning across more than 10 petabytes of geospatial data. We've got a great team with decades of machine learning, remote sensing, large scale computing, astrophysics and cosmology experience. We've got quite a few offices, but our headquarters are in, the, in Santa Fe, New Mexico, which is pretty unusual. Uh, if you've never been to that part of the world, it's beautiful. And this is pretty much what my drive to work looks like every day. So what can you do with the Descartes Labs platform? Well, two pretty recent public examples where uh, we have wildfire detection. And so this is where we have um, some inference and analysis being on data uh, run on data streams that come from the what's called the Go satellite within minutes of the satellite passing over a re region. So within you know a few minutes, uh, we can tell you if there's uh, a probability of some fire detected in a region. Um, we're also doing, uh, we also had some recent public methane emission studies and uh, this, you know, we've got some ongoing partnerships around that and this is where we're looking at uh, Sentinel 5P satellite data. This is large scale analysis over large time frames, big compute jobs, as you might imagine. So what do I even mean by mission critical delivery? Well, at any given time we have thousands of machine learning jobs hitting our APIs and they're extracting insights from complex geospatial data sets. That's historical data, big jobs, and also real time. So we've got models running on our platform and they, they can make decisions or generate insights within minutes of the satellite passing overhead. But with this going on, we also have a background where our APIs are rapidly evolving. We have new features coming out, bug fixes, new and revised models, and we're actually seeing up to five deploys per day for our core services. And so you've got this combination of time sensitive intelligence generation and a rapidly evolving platform uh, and that means we've developed some insights into safe, mission-critical delivery. So let's talk a little bit about the value of high-velocity continuous delivery to us. Well, we found internally that a high deploy frequency corresponded with smaller changes that were easier to understand, debug, and reconcile. And when those changes introduced problems into production, and of course that still happens, they tended to be lower impact and we could pin the problems down quickly. And so coupled with the short lead time for changes, it was often very easy for our developers to see a problem in production and then quickly roll forward to fix the problem. They could, of course, still roll back. Um, and our anecdotal experience seems to be consistent, the, the, or generally true, let's say. The Accelerate State of DevOps report demonstrates that increasing deployment frequency and reducing lead time for changes correlates with a, a lower change failure rate and a shorter time to recover from service incidents and defects. So as we worked on our continuous deployment infrastructure early on, and this is the SRE team, you know, um, it's, it's worth mentioning that we're not a continuous deployment team. Um, we, we discovered a few things early on. Uh, one, manually creating deployment pipelines for each application was error prone and just didn't scale. Two, having SREs in the critical path for adding and configuring specific applications was slow and inefficient. It was hard to make developing pipelines for a new application, our top priority when we have a thousand other things and it's not receiving user traffic at that time. And three, having SREs responsible for day-to-day -day operations and deployment pipelines was ineffective and didn't scale. So I just want to give you some quick context on our infrastructure because it explains some of the, the um, patterns we describe later. Um, so first I'd like to do an experiment, repeat an experiment from last year. Who in the room is familiar with Istio? Okay, and uh, who is using Istio in production? All right, definitely more than last year. I saw a few hands there. 
Um, so yeah, we use Istio and Kubernetes. Uh, all our traffic goes through Istio. Um, and Istio is an extremely powerful service mesh and it has some great features. We use the advanced traffic routing, rich telemetry, so we get L7 metrics back from our application for free. And it also handles authentication and authorization both uh, on ingress into the cluster service to service. And we use features like you know, U URI rewriting or request and response rewriting. But you don't really need to know anything about Istio for this talk. For this talk, all you have to think about uh, as Istio as a reverse proxy. Traffic comes in, it routes incoming traffic to the desired pods. We configure that routing through Kubernetes custom resource definitions. They're called Istio virtual services. And then Istio provides telemetry about the traffic. Another thing I want to talk about is staging. <laughs> in our own company, we found out that people, different teams, had different concepts of what staging meant. And we kind of had a radical shift in the past year. Uh, originally, we used staging as part of our critical deployment pipeline. And th today, we do not do that. We have a staging cluster, but we do not test releases there. We found it was a maintenance burden syncing our staging production environments. Testing the stage just wasn't representative of our production environment. We didn't have the same number of database connections. Resource utilization wasn't the same. And, and like I said, stage became part of our high velocity pipelines. And so you know, we're pushing for this high frequency deployment, but we've, now, we've now, now made our stage environment a critical piece of that and really impacted what we could do in our, in our stage envir environment for testing. And so as we thought about this, we found, oh, actually, there's some really great lit literature around this. And I've linked a couple of articles from Cindy uh, or Copy Construct that really explain why testing and staging isn't great and why we should be able to do testing in production. Uh, it's about two and a half hours of reading, I'll just warn you. So today, we, our deployment pipelines deployed to a pre-release endpoint. That's an endpoint that our internal team can hit that's in production that customer traffic doesn't go to. To a release endpoint, that's the endpoint that most of the time, 100% of traffic is going to, unless we're in the middle of a canary rollout. And I'll talk about that later. We have a dev endpoint. And this is a infrequently used, very sort of well-guarded endpoint where we can deploy a specially customized version of a service uh, just, just to tweak how it interacts with prod during development. And, and it's short-lived. Um, and we also have baseline and canary deployment. So we can't route traffic to there specifically. Um, that, that happens automatically as part of a canary deployment. So this is what the Kubernetes cluster looks like from the perspective of one service. Traffic comes in. It goes to the Istio ingress gateway. And we have three virtual services that, again, the Kubernetes custom resource definitions that tell Istio how we want to move our traffic. And so we have a dedicated virtual service for our pre-release endpoint. We have a virtual service for our release endpoint. And like I said, normally 100% of traffic is going to the release deployment unless we're doing a baseline and canary. And then we have a separate uh, virtual service for our dev endpoint. And pre-release and release are always there. Pre-release always gets deployed as part of our continuous deployment pipeline, and then obviously releases where our traffic goes to. But the other, others are ephemeral. So as a developer at Descartes Labs, how do you go from development to production? Well, we do our development in Git, and we use GitHub. Uh, we have a mono repo with Python, Rust, and Go in it. We use trunk-based development. And usually, we're seeing, we see pull requests coming in from short-lived branches. And so the development time there is from hours to days. Assuming your, your pull request is approved and merged, then we trigger our build and push stage, which happens with Bazel and Drone. Um, this is triggered by GitHub Webhook. Um, and assuming all the tests pass, everything goes smoothly, it ends up with a push to our container registry. And this triggers the last part, the part we really care about. Um, and this is the deploy stage. And we use Spinnaker. And this stage typically takes less than 40 minutes. But that's 40 minutes before 100% of traffic is going to the new image. It's actually much quicker than that for a new image to start receiving production traffic. Um, so this is tr triggered by a PubSub message and deploys to Kubernetes through this one continuous deployment pipeline, uh, which I will describe. So we use pipeline templating, but we're not using managed pipeline temp templating. We have our own pipeline templating architecture. Um, 
In, for, the, for the pipeline templating, the way it works, uh, our architecture is we have the configuration living alongside the application code in monorepo. And that has some implications. We could talk about that afterwards. But what we have is we have a config.json, and that statically parameterizes our pipeline template for one instance of an application. So that, yeah, that configures the, the pipeline for an application. And then we have the pipeline dynamically parameterize our Kubernetes manifest during uh, continuous deployment execution. <coughs> and I'll explain how that works. So if you're a developer and you want to start deploying a new application to our production environment, here's what you have to do. You have to copy an example spinnaker config.json and some Kubernetes YAMLs into your application folder. You have to set the deployment name in the config.json and, and actually that's it. That's all you have to do. Uh, automation picks up the new files and starts templating the deployment pipelines and uh, we're using Jinja for our pipeline templating. While a developer's on a branch, they can see the, the pipelines available as build artifacts and they could, they could import that into uh, Spinnaker if they wanted to. Um, and once the, uh, the development, you know, they're happy with where it is, they submit a PR and it's approved and merged, at that point the pipelines are automatically applied via the spin CLI. And this sets up our Kubernetes deployments, our horizontal pod autoscalers, um, and the Kubernetes services along with the Istio virtual services needed for traffic to get to the service. And this is a bit scary, seeing as this is self-service, um, so we have a little bit of protection in the form of we namespace the uh, Spinnaker application based on the application folder name in our monorepo, but that's about it. Um, I don't mention anything about secrets. We have a different workflow for secrets. Uh, we use uh, Terraform for managing those, and we have a workflow that uses code owners and Atlantis. So Atlantis is something that interacts with Git and lets you do Terraform in a, in a, in a nice way. <laughs> our uh, Ginger Pipeline templates, uh, they're about as readable as raw pipeline JSON. We do some stuff like we substitute variables, so we'll insert our service name. We have conditional stages, so here's an example. I don't know, hopefully you can see that from there. If a, if a deployment doesn't need a config map, uh, it evaluates to false, and so that stage is disabled. And we also do looped stage insertion. So we allow for any number of pre-deployed jobs that happen before the pre-release endpoint is updated. And uh, what they can do is stuff like uh, smoke tests with production, they can do schema migrations, that kind of thing. Our most complicated pipeline template is about 500 lines. Um, and you know, uh, that, that's about as long as our most, pop, uh, most, uh, most complicated uh, pipeline, parameterized pipeline, uh, as you might guess. Generating the pipeline is very straightforward. There is a little bit of pain here, right? There's something worth calling out. Uh, we're using quite a bit of the Spinnaker expression language, and so the debugging process can be a little painful because some things are evaluated at template time, uh, like statically, and then some things are evaluated at execution time. This is where we're parameterizing stuff in our manifest, and we'll show how that works in a minute. What does the spin config.json look like? It's really simple. This is just it's perfectly representative of an example. Uh, so we have it split into deployment configuration and pipeline configuration. And so in deployment configuration, we say, okay, what's the service name? What's the image we're gonna be matching against? Where are we deploying this thing? How many replicas do we want minimum? What's the minimum number of replicas we want for our pre-release and our release endpoint? We also allow you to insert dynamically some environment variables. So if you want to configure the pre-release deployment slightly differently to the release one, but we really frown on you doing that. We really want pre-release to look just like release. Um, at the bottom, we actually specify the pipelines we want to use. There's a one-click rollback pipeline. Um, there's you know, various other bits and pieces that allow us to deploy based on manifest changes in addition to uh, uh, image changes. Uh, but the most complicated pipeline here is the continuous deployment pipeline. And here in this example, we say, OK, we, we don't want a canary on this execution. And that means we need to have a manual approval on the deployment. And we want to define some pre-deploy jobs. We, we're going to have a job called migrate schema, and it's of type migrations. And actually, all this does is it tells the Spinnaker pipeline to make a uh, uh, run job or deploy, uh, run a uh, Kubernetes job uh, with uh, a manifest, and this tells it where to find that manifest. That, that's it. So that's how we configure the pipelines. And then at runtime, when the pipeline is running, this is how we can dynamically change the properties of our deployment manifest. And so here you can see we've got what looks like a pretty regular deployment manifest, but we've got a 
custom stage and a custom name. And so we're say, we've got this uh, spell function here, root. And what root means is root says, grab the variable stage from the stage that's executing right now. And so when we template our pipelines, we set the variable stage to be dev. If it's a dev deployment, we set the variable st stage to pre-release at the release stage and release uh, at the, oh, sorry, pre-release at the pre-release stage and release at the release stage. And so every time this template, uh, every time this, uh, this manifest is applied, um, we, we, get it to, we template it for the different targets we're trying to deploy. And that's how we control our dev pre-release, release canary and baseline deployments. And this is how we can use the same manifests for many different deployments. Um, this is a very similar example, but with our HPA, you can see at the bottom, we're customizing the, the oh, well, we're customizing the name and the target name in the same fashion. Um, and there, there's sli some slightly uglier spell here. We're you know, doing a two int call on the result of the root, uh, the pulling the min replicas variable from the stage that's executing. But there's also another reason why I wanted to show you this. It's because at the bottom, you, you may be able to see there's this target connections per pod. That's obviously not a real uh, eight, uh, horizontal pod autoscaler uh, configuration. Um, but we do scale on the number of connections per, per deployment. And we do that using the Zalando cube metric, metric adapter, scraping some special metrics that we get from using Istio, which uses Envoy under the hood. And this will come up later. So let's look at the continuous deployment pipeline. Uh, here it is. There's not too many stages involved. Uh, this is, this is you know, as rep totally representative of, uh, of a real continuous deployment pipeline for our infrastructure. And you can see there are two entry points to our continuous deployment pipeline. We allow for a manual trigger. If a developer wants to deploy something special, it has to match that prefix we showed, the image prefix. But if a developer wants to go back and deploy a previous version, they can. Um, we also, generally, almost all the executions run off the pub sub trigger. And you'll notice it's kind of interesting. Those two entry points are actually evaluate variable stage. That, that's what we start our pipeline off with. And so the evaluate variable stage lets you set some variables uh, that you can consume at other stages of your pipeline. Uh, and we do do that. You can see here we're setting tag um, at the bottom of the screen. Uh, but it also, in our case, we, we sort of backdoor some functionality into it. We use the evaluate variable stage to evaluate a bunch of really quite gnarly spell that we don't want hidden away in the, the pipeline itself. We want an operator to be able to click here and see what was evaluated as the product of the spell. And so one thing we do is we modify the incoming image artifact to deploy based on the tag instead of the SHA. Um, our developers wanted to do that, and there's some good reasons to do that. Uh, we we, we want to be able to reason about the deployments, and actually we use some properties of the deployments um, uh, later on. Uh, yeah, we use that information <laughs> about the current image tag from the deployment later on. And so here's uh, an example of what the evaluate variables stage looks like, and it's a little hard to see, but here we've got you know, some spell that's not actually setting a variable, we're actually evaluating spell, and it's setting you know, the parameters image tag, and it's updating actually the trigger resolved, resolved expected artifacts uh, property. So a little, a little gnarly, like I said, but it's, it's pretty useful. So the image tag of our deployed images uh, over, over here on the right hand side, uh, you can see that the image tag uh, includes a hash at the end of it. And that hash is the git SHA for the triggering commit. So, we're, yeah, we'll use that later on. So in the second stage of this pipeline, we get our image tag of the release deployment. And this is used for, one, we know the current image that's being deployed, and we know the image that's already at release, and so we can easily generate a GitHub diff link that shows the commits that differ between the two versions, that, you know, the, the version that's being deployed and what's in production. And usually this is pretty short, uh, because we're deploying so frequently. But we also need to use this image that we retrieve as part of our canary analysis, and I'll, I'll explain how later. In this pipeline, in this, this particular example, the service didn't need a config map, and so the way we disable the config map deployment is we actually just uh, have, um, we have uh, something evaluate to false, and it just skips the stage. Uh, but we could just 
template that out, right? Not include it. Um, there is a pre-deployed job. It says e ES migrate schema. And yeah, in this case, it's a schema migration. And what this does is it runs a Kubernetes job that does the migration we need. It checks whether the migration was successful and then it cleans itself up. So then we deploy the pre-release endpoint. And like I said before, the pre-release endpoint is something that our developers can hit, but no production traffic goes to. And in this case, we didn't have canaries enabled, so an operator must manually approve the promotion to production. That's a manual judgment stage. And for the operator, you can see in the manual judgment instructions, there's the GitHub diff link. They can click on it, and they'll show them the diff. And they go, OK, yeah, I'm confident about what's rolling out here. And so they're happy, and they click approve, and the application is deployed to release. And this is just a Kubernetes rolling update, like usual. Um, and, and this release endpoint, you know, your, your new image is going to start receiving production traffic. So we used to actually have quite a bit of content in our manual judgment stage. We had links to Grafana and so on. Um, but we don't do that. We've got a very simple stage, as you saw. And we're actually able to surface some of our monitoring links directly in the clusters view by adding custom annotations to our deployments. And this is a Spinnaker feature. And this, this, would, this link would take you to a Grafana dashboard for the service. So let's talk about pipeline operations. Well, I don't know about you folks, but life looked a little like this for us at Descartes Labs. Developer, number of developers grew steadily, number of applications uh, took off exponentially, and the uh, SRE team very slowly grew. Um, so this obviously, having the SRE team as pipeline operators was, wasn't going to work. And uh, with the right sales pitch, we were able to get good buy-in from our development teams who are interested in managing their own application deployments. And honestly, I think we all know this, application developers are often best equipped to understand behavior and diagnose issues. And it, it's really reasonable and easy to do when you're able to do a deployment uh, so rapidly. Um, so Spinnaker actually provides several features that facilitate pushing pipeline operation to application developers. There's great authorization. We can restrict pipeline execution to individual teams. There's an audit trail. We can tr clearly track who executed manual triggers or approvals or who did that rollback. Um, and we've got rich diagnostics. You can view the deployment pod health and logs from within the Spinnaker UI. And like the biggest win here, so I say this, this means we can limit Kubernetes access from developers. Yeah, like the, the biggest win here is that we have developers that just don't know how to use Kubernetes. They're not familiar with the Kubernetes UI. They get everything they need from Spinnaker. And that, that's, that's just a great place to be. So let's recap some of those early experiences. Uh, manually creating deployment pipelines for each application was error prone and did not scale. Well, that's taken care of by pipeline templates and automated deployments. Having SREs in the critical path for adding and configuring specific application pipelines was slow and inefficient. And this is taken care of us by our self-service pipeline and configuration and deployment architecture. And finally, having SREs responsible for day-to-day -day operations of deployment pipelines was ineffective and also didn't scale. And that was taken care of uh, by developers as pipeline operators. Um, I hope this doesn't sound bad, but the SRE team wants to spend as little time on Spinnaker as possible. And in the past year, I looked at the number of Jira tickets that had mentioned Spinnaker at all, and it was 12%. And I, I think I see that as a win. That includes lots of operational tickets, like you know, Spinnaker fell over. So let's talk about the safe part, the safer deployments. And we achieve safer deployments using canaries. What is a canary? Well, it's a deployment that incrementally rolls out application changes to subsets of users. Uh, this is normally done by rerouting some fraction of traffic. Um, we validate the behavior with that fraction of traffic, and then we update all of production. Uh, yeah, then we, uh, then, then we update all of production if we're happy with the behavior we saw. Um, so a couple of questions you might have if you're familiar with Kubernetes. Uh, don't Kubernetes deployment rollouts use canaries? Yes, they do. Um, but the simplistic canary criteria based on liveness or readiness checks, or if your application just falls over immediately. Um, if a deployment is rolled out all the way and uh, you want to roll back, uh, that's, that's pretty slow. Um, and finally, uh, and this is a pretty important one, traffic routing is related to pod counts. And this is an extreme example, but if we had three pods in our deployment that were serving 100% of traffic, and we updated just one of them with our new image, that receives 33% of traffic, because it's evenly distributed across the pods. 
Kubernetes uh, canaries are great, and they're really great if your application is broken, but then they're not so useful if your application has a higher error rate. Uh, we, we want both, but uh, yeah, we want both. Using, uh, yeah, Istio provides a mechanism for fine-grained canary rollouts, along with the high-level metrics we need regarding service behavior. Uh, and yeah, like I was saying, we, need, we want Kubernetes canaries and Istio canaries at the same time. Um, so you might also ask a question, we're talking about Istio and we're using Istio for fine-grained routing, uh, but can't Spinnaker manage traffic routing? And it can, and, and uh, I will admit we haven't really heavily explored this, uh, but the current model, I believe, relies on replica sets and it has the same traffic routing constraints uh, as I described above. In order to do a canary, you need a baseline. So what is a baseline? Well, in our original canary pipeline, we compared the canary against our release deployment. We thought, why do we need a baseline? And uh, this has several issues. So one obvious issue is the release deployment is stable or scaling down, while the canary is scaling up. Your release was just receiving 100% of traffic. You start doing a canary, it's now receiving less traffic. Um, you know, it, it might be scaling down. So we know that the canary is seeing more traffic volume per pod. Uh, sorry, the release, uh, yeah, the canary is seeing more traffic volume per pod than the release. Um, another big issue is the release is warmed up. Uh, you know, it's got stuff cached, it's got open upstream connections. It's obviously not the same as our scaling up canary deployment. And then a more subtle problem you can run into, but the release deployment might have slow burning problems. So if you had a slow memory leak that was in your uh, release deployment, that's also in your new canary that's rolling out. Um, if we deploy the canary, or sorry, if we start rolling out the canary and it's got a more <coughs> serious memory consumption problem, a problem that's actually going to bite us, then that problem can be masked because the release deployment's been out there for a while, its memory consumption's been growing, and it hides the newly introduced problem. And that, that's a more subtle failure mode. Um, so using a baseline deployment, which is where we actually do a deployment, a new, a fresh deployment of our release image and scale that in just the same way as our canary uh, un under the same conditions is the best way to meaningfully compare uh, application versions. So how does adding a canary change our continuous deployment pipeline? Well, it's almost exactly the same as before, but we've replaced the manual approval stage with a stage that deploys the baseline, which again is a copy of our release image, and the canary, which is our new image that's been deployed, and then we run the canary rollout. And that's, that's uh, running the canary rollout, it means run a, a separate pipeline. And when we run this pipeline, we already have our baseline, we have our canary, we have, you know, we have our release image. We don't need to do any more deployments, we just need to switch traffic to the baseline and canary and see what happens. And so, at the beginning of this, we got a canary rollout, and it's 10%. And that, that means we're going to send 80% of our traffic to release, and 10% of traffic to our baseline, and 10% to our canary. Um, and release, again, means the endpoint that had been, up until that point, receiving 100% of customer traffic. How do we do this change in routing? Well, we use Istio Virtual Services, and I'll show you how that works in just a moment. Um, at the analysis stage, the, this is the first analysis stage, uh, we warm up for one minute <laughs> and then we collect data for 10 minutes and we verify that the canary is healthy. This is an extremely short window of time, uh, but uh, it's a good first sanity check. And I, I was very interested to hear Armory talking about 15 minute canaries yesterday. If you change that, it's very small. Um, you can see that there's a 100 next to the stage, and that means we got a score of 100 out of 100, and I'll explain how that works in a moment. So this passed, we're happy with the canary so far. And so now we update our routing, so we're sending 34% of traffic to our release endpoint, and 33% uh, you know, to the baseline and 33% to the canary. For this final stage, we're collecting data for 20 minutes, and we have no warm up. And at the end of that, we verify that the canary is healthy. And so in this case, you can see the pipeline was a success, and this would have resulted in our image that was being canaried being uh, 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 pushed to our production endpoint, release endpoint. And you may be able to see there's a little red exclamation mark next to the 100 score 
on the canary analysis pane. Um, that's, uh, that's because the, uh, the uh, analysis is unhappy uh, because we collected less than 50 samples. Um, so we're using Stackdriver as our metric source. The, the way we're doing aggregations, we end up with uh, one sample per minute. And so for a 20 minute canary, we've got roughly 20 data points. Um, I know, uh, I've heard, for example, that Netflix recommends three one hour canaries. Um, and with five deploys per day, that would be 15 hours. So at, at the moment, that model wouldn't work for us with this sequential deployment uh, pattern for our services. So you saw we were getting 100 out of 100, but what, what does that even mean? Where does it come from? How do we define these metrics? Um, and, uh, and here is how we, we set up the default metric set for our canaries. And so we call this, um, I think, simple metrics. This, that's what this group is called. And so you can see that we've got just four metrics we check. Two of them are Istio metrics. So we look at the number of healthy responses, and we look at the 95th percentile latency for our application. And two of our metrics that come from Kubernetes, they look at the CPU utilization per pod and the memory utilization. And at the bottom here, you can see there's metric group weights, and that sets up how much each of your metric, how much the result of your metric succeeding or failing uh, weighs. And so the total of that has to add up to 100. And here we've set Istio metrics are, are weighed 60. And so that means if either of the uh, Istio metrics fail, we lose 30 points. And if both fail, we lose 60 points. Similarly, if we just had a Kubernetes metrics are set up with a weight of 40. And so if either of those fail, we just lose 20 points. Uh, hopefully that's clear. How this actually feeds into the pipeline is shown here. So on the left hand side, you can see how we configured an individual metric. And here, this is the 95th percentile. And so we've said this should fail on an increase in the latency. Um, the metric type here that's defined, that tells Spinnaker what specific metric we want to fetch from our metric service, which in our case is Stackdriver. And then at the bottom, the filter tells the analysis stage how to extract the actual points from that metric for the canary versus the points we want for the baseline. And it does this by inserting the values that we define for the baseline uh, and the canary in the uh, canary analysis configuration. And that's shown on the right. And so the, the keyword you see set for the, the baseline is my service dash baseline. And when, when the canary analysis stage wants to fetch the metrics for the baseline, it's going to insert my service baseline as metric label dot destination underscore service underscore name. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. So that's how the metric analysis is ab uh, able to, the canary analysis is able to grab a group of points that represent the baseline performance and a group of points that represent the canary de uh, 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 deployment performance. And I'm sort of laboring this point because it's pretty hard to get your head around this. So we're dynamically steering traffic. We send 10% to our canary and then we send 33% to our canary. And you're probably wondering what complicated magic we're using to do that. And it is, in fact, incredibly simple. This is the guts of it. Uh, we dynamically steer our traffic with Spinnaker and Istio. So on the left, you could see just a regular deploy manifest stage. It's really short. It's really simple. And in this deploy manifest stage, we've added a bunch of variables. We've set release weight to 80, for example. And that means 80% of traffic goes to the release. That's what we want it to mean. And the way that works is, over on the right in our Istio virtual service manifest, we've said, OK, when you're deploying this manifest, fetch the release weight from the stage that's deploying me and insert that value as the weight. And so that's how we're able to set the release to 80%, the baseline to 10%, and the canary weight to 10%. And this example of a virtual service you see, where for our release, uh, like for our traffic coming into my service, uh, we, we, uh, we route to the three endpoints. That's what we use all the time. Even when we're not in the middle of a canary, it's the same template. We just have 100% of traffic going to our uh, release endpoint normally. And so, uh, like release uh, deployment. And so, um, yeah, th th we're dependent on some pretty complicated 
uh, Istio capabilities behind the scenes. There's virtual serve rule merging, and it's a kind of interesting topic if you want to talk about it, but you don't really even need to know about that. So um, you might have some questions about our canary analysis, and I, I quit canary about that, and I wouldn't blame you. So why 10% and 33%? Well, 10% provides enough metric volume for many of our services, and it does still keep the impact surface fairly small. 33% of traffic is, you know, we found it statistically representative. Uh, obviously, we couldn't go above 50% in this existing model where that would be 50% to the canary and 50% to the baseline, and at that point, nothing would be going to the release deployment. Are two stages enough? Well, more stages means more complexity and a slower deployment rollout. Um, are there scaling problems? Well, okay, one problem that I'm sure it definitely happens is that when we're doing our canary and baseline, because of such a short warm-up and such a short analysis stage, our deployments are often scaling up. Um, and that's one of the big benefits of comparing against the baseline, the canary against the baseline, because that's scaling up under exactly the same circumstances. And I'm going to make uh, a, a crappy argument that you know, this may actually represent more of an extreme load scenario than, than if it had stabilized, uh, which we might want. Um, another thing to think about is if we're at a point where only 34% of traffic is going to our release and the canary fails, or even if the canary succeeds, but let's say the canary fails, we'll switch 100% of traffic back to release. And, you know, it was 20 minutes we were doing that canary analysis for. Our release could have very easily scaled down in that time frame, and we just tripled the traffic. Well, we kind of short-circuit that problem. Uh, I mentioned before that we have a custom HPA that scales based on connection counts. And so what we can do is we just configure the release endpoint to scale both based on the total connections across the release canary and baseline. And so that never scales down, or it only scales appropriately with the changes in total traffic volume. So let's look at uh, some of the results of the analysis. When you're actually looking at the uh, canary analysis stages, you can click a link and it'll take you to the results. Uh, so we'll look at a couple of those. So here's an example of a successful canary analysis. Uh, you can see all the numbers look pretty sane, and I've clicked on CPU utilization. Now, it's easier to physically reason about the results when you look at the time series or the histogram views, but it's easier to understand the canary judgment when you look at the bee swarm plot, and that's what I'm showing you here. You can see, well, the canary is pretty statistically representative of the uh, baseline performance. Here's an example where a developer had a really good idea to improve performance. Uh, they realized, uh, yeah, they realized they, they had a, a better approach, and so it got approved, it got reviewed, approved, and merged, and they were right. It's probably hard to tell from where you're sitting, but the number of healthy responses went up 23%, the, the total count, and the 23% uh, relative to the baseline, and the 95th percentile latency actually dropped, uh, dropped by, I think it's 5%. Five, 5 uh, sorry, yeah, the latency dropped by 5%. So, so far, so good, uh, but the CPU utilization doubled, <laughs> and the memory utilization went up by roughly a third. And so in this case, uh, the, uh, the, the canary analysis failed. Um, and, uh, and we can go away, we can have a discussion. Are we willing to accept you know, this change in performance characteristics in order to get these gains? We might be. Um, OK, um, but, uh, but we'll have to manually by bypass that. OK, so I'm going to quickly walk you through a tale of two canaries. So here is, we're looking at those two canary analysis stages you just viewed. So here, this is showing the traffic volume to uh, release at version one deployment. That's the purple line. And at the bottom, you can see a new canary comes out. That's at version two. And a baseline comes out. And that's obviously at version one. So at first, we've got 10% of traffic going to the canary and baseline and 80% to our release endpoint. And that starts to scale down. And the canary and baseline, you see the traffic volume appear on the graph. Um, this first stage passes, and so now we're in a position where we want to send 33% of traffic to our canary and baseline. And you see them scale up as we change the traffic routing. And this second canary succeeds, and so we start rolling out a new deployment of release using the version 2 image. And you can see all the other deployments scale down in terms of traffic volume, and the release at version 2 scales up. 
And so now we have no traffic going to our canary, no traffic going to our baseline, 100% to our release. Uh, so now this is the second failed uh, canary analysis stage you saw later on. And in this case, we, were, we have a canary at version 3 and our release of baseline are now at version 2. We have 10% of traffic go to the canary and baseline. And I'll, this one actually fails at the 10% analysis stage. And so we start sending 100% of traffic back to release and we delete the canary and baseline. So do canaries, uh, canaries sound great? <laughs> do they solve all of our problems? Uh, no, they're not a magic bullet. Um, we run into all sorts of problems. You can have, we've got a ton of node and pod churn in our cluster as it scales up and down. And so we can see problems with Kubernetes, we can see problems with nodes where we can't provision a node for the, the canary or baseline to run on or one gets scheduled and the other doesn't. Uh, we see things like 429s coming back from the stack driver metrics endpoint. We've hit our quota and I, I, I don't think uh, the canary analysis stage retries the pull of metrics and so that, that throws an error and the canary fails. But overall canaries seem to be working very well. So how does this all work out? Well, let's look at some of the numbers. Uh, we've got 16 services actively deployed by our continuous de delivery pipeline. And we average three deploys per day for each service. Although, uh, I will be honest, fewer than that make it to the release endpoint. Um, at, the, at a recent time, I looked at the number of rollbacks and we hadn't had any rollbacks for three months. Um, and I guess one of the most important points for me is we spent four engineer months on Spinnaker tickets in the past 12 months. And that includes all of the work you see here pretty much and lots of operational time. So uh, that's fixing Cloud Driver fell over, Redis is choking, Retrofit 500, you, you know the drill. And, and of course, upgrading Spinnaker when there are new features and releases. So in conclusion, Combining Kubernetes, Istio, and Spinnaker can help you build a deployment ecosystem that allows for safe, mission-critical, continuous delivery without sacrificing velocity. If you focus your resources on building out a self-service pipeline architecture, which scales across development teams, that can increase application deployment velocity. Uh, High-frequency deployments with a short lead time for changes and application-level canaries can help provide the confidence you need for fully automated deployment into production, and all these factors together improve reliability with quite constrained engineering resources. What's next for Descartes? What do we think about doing next? Well, we're, we're very interested in maintaining SLOs and we're, we're, we have uh, multiple window SLOs and uh, we're talking about implementing a feature I'm gonna call SLWO, I'm very sorry for that, uh, which will uh, disable automated canaries for new feature deployments. Um, but, but will it still allow bug fixes through? Speaking of which, uh, we want better tracking between feature development and deploys. We want to link our Spinnaker deployments back to Jira, which is what we use. We want to know if, how many uh, failed canaries or rollbacks or bug fixes a release uh, ended up in. And we want to have a, uh, th finally, we want to have an option to mirror production traffic instead of splitting it for some of our service services where that's safe to do. Um, Here's the Descartes Labs SRE team. Uh, Nora Lutz is my partner in crime when it comes to Spinnaker development and, and operational work. Rob Salmon is our Terraform wizard and genius. Um, and Tim Kelton is our boss. And uh, I'm just going to fade Dan in at the end. He just joined our team and uh, would have changed my numbers if I, if I included him in terms of engineer hours. So uh, yeah, Dan, Dan uh, just moved to the SRE team. OK, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, do you have any questions? I will say uh, before I take any questions that we uh, that I did put this talk and some example stuff in my uh, GitHub repo, uh, which you can see at the following link. Okay, thank you. Okay, we've got somebody with a mic. Uh, hey, I'm Tiny. Uh, I do have a question, it's more of a Istio related uh, stuff. <coughs> we are using Ambassador today for, as an L7 proxy, uh -huh. but uh, we are evaluating uh, Istio as a service mesh, uh -huh. but not as a L7 proxy itself, uh, with respect to authorization. So what were your, your experiences with authorization and how difficult is it to basically do the authorization on Istio? Um, what authorization do you have on your services? Uh, okay, so I will say that uh, 
We have our MTLS mode set to permissive, so it's basically an opt-in authorization model for service to service. Um, the other thing we're doing is JWT validation at the ingress. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Yes. Okay. And we, we do. Have, we have need to do JWT ingress also. We are using O365. O365 is our uh, provider for validation. Okay. So it would basically. I just realized though, I talked more about authentication rather than authorization. So we do have selective routing in our virtual service configuration based on your group membership. Uh, so that's more of an authorization answer. Thank you. Hey, uh, my name is Jitesh. I see in one of your pipeline you're talking about the schema migration process. Do you use a particular tool like Flyway or Liquibase or anything like that, or how is that, how is that managed? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so I know we use Alembic. Um, I think for our Elasticsearch schema migrations, uh, we manage them ourselves. Uh, but uh, like we, we just do uh, the, we explicitly do the schema migration. And we always make sure our schema migrations, um, what's the right way to put it, like idempotent and additive, so we can always roll back. That's for ES, if you could always deploy any version of our service and it should still work. There may be some exceptions around that, but that, that's the philosophy there and that simplifies a lot, a lot of problems. So you manage to have a point in time backup and restore if there is any issues comes in with the team? Uh, yeah, so we actually do, uh, we do snapshots of our ES uh, cluster every single day, um, but uh, it, it, the, the point was really if we actually deployed an older version of our service, there, there are going to be exceptions to this, but the philosophy of our schema changes is such that the, those older versions should still work. Hey, uh, great presentation. Um, so a question I had, uh, it sounds like there's a baseline templates. Are those centrally managed or, or like uh, can various like application owners, so for example, um, we have a security team, we may have a quality team, we may have all these teams. Uh, do you have them kind of as a comment or do you kind of like own the SRE block? So by the baseline templates, do you mean the configuration for metrics or do you mean the, the deployment manifest? Sorry, very early in the presentation, you said developers have like a config JSON. When they oh. have, and then the, cent the centrally managed where things kind of get filled into. Kind of I see. Uh, yeah, like I said, that lives along application, alongside application code. Um, and there's just one size fits all. You know, all developers work within our mono repo. I mean, that's not strictly true, but all developers that are deploying to Spinnaker work in our mono repo. Um, I will say that there are some constraints by having deployment configuration live alongside application code, and uh, we have workarounds for that, but uh, I can talk about that offline if you're interested. Okay, thank you.